Good afternoon. Um, I'm Sarah Schroth, the Mary and James Siemens Director of the Nasher Museum of Art. And it's my extreme pleasure to be able to welcome you um, this afternoon. I was supposed to be on a plane, but something happened. And so I, I, I was just so happy that I could be here to tell you how excited I am about this conference, how excited I am that you are all here, every single one of you. It's an impressive list, it's incredible. The work you do is so essential to me. It's so, to me, it's really essential. To the world, it's really essential. It's extremely important. So I'm so happy that you're gathered together and you can share and talk to each other. It's gonna be fabulous. One of my first initiatives was to, in, some, in a staff meeting, I said, well, okay, here are my initiatives, one, two, three. And the one I wanted, you know, first initiative was to start an Alzheimer's program here at the Nasher. We hadn't done anything like this. We, we really were concentrating on K through 12. So I said this at a staff meeting and Jessica Ruley, who is our, you've probably already met her, but she's our director of education and programs, Jessica said, well, I want to do that too. And so it's pretty incredible. I had an immediate staff member who took this on and I'm so appreciative to her. And you'll hear from her in a minute because she's going to introduce our speaker. I really need to be able to express great gratitude to some people who have supported us in this specific program. Uh, Stephanie Kahn, I wondered if you would just stand up a minute. I know I'm going to embarrass her. I know that. But this is Stephanie Kahn, and she and her husband, Doug, um, have... Oh, there's Doug! Doug, stand up. <laughs> Doug, stand up, Doug. Stand up. <laughs> Without Stephanie and Doug, this program just would not be here. So we're extremely, extremely grateful to them both. And um, Stephanie's a gallery guide, and she helps with the program, so she knows a lot about it. And you, so you'll see her um, in different workshops and, and lectures, and just go right up to her and say thank you, and to Doug, too. And the, speaking of gallery guides, we have several gallery guides also in the audience. And I want to thank them for their work and their creativity in making these tours at the Nasher so exceptional. You know, we're a university art museum. We're, we're connected to Duke, a great university. But we're also the only art museum in Durham, the city that we are in. So um, we're also a community museum. And this is a community uh, program, except, you know, one thing I thought always would be interesting would be that if we connected this program to the medical center, to you know, physicians who are doing research on Alzheimer's. You know, that's been a little harder than we thought it would be, <laughs> but we're working on it. We're really working on it, and Jessica's made good strides, and uh, I think that will uh, help all of us, actually, if we connect that a little bit with research. Um, another person I want to thank is Brittany Halberstadt. Brittany, um, you probably corresponded with her already. Brittany is um, a, you were a freshman, now you're going to be a sophomore. And she works um, for this program. We've hired her. She's amazing. I had her as a student. She's amazing. And so, you know, Brittany, I want to thank Brittany. <laughs> And there are other supporters in the room, too, that, that I'd like to thank. And this daily work could not happen without you. And last, I need to thank the Carlisle Adams Foundation. Um, without their generous support, this conference wouldn't be happening. With their support, they, we were able to offer some funding for travel um, and get in some of the best leaders in the field. I'm very excited about this. It's a really great thing to get you all together. And I know it's going to be exciting, and I have just a little tiny, tiny word to say. Find a friend. Find a mentor. Um, you know, I, I, if somebody had said that to me when I first attended my first director's conference, that, that would have been useful. But it's true. I mean, you know, it's all about networking in this world. And, you know, we, we learn from each other, we help from each other. So don't be shy, just go up to somebody 
and just say, I want to be your friend, and then, you know. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to Jessica now. Jessica, and thank you, Jessica. I'm so proud of you, very proud of you. Thank you, Sarah. I am Jessica Ruley, the Director of Education and Public Programs here at the Nasher. As we thank people this afternoon, I especially thank Sarah for her leadership and support. As she discussed from the very beginning of our Reflections program, she has pushed and encouraged for this to continually grow and expand, for which I am very grateful. Like Sarah, I am thrilled to welcome all of you to Durham and to the Nasher. I'm looking forward to spending the next few days together getting to discuss the work that we do. So many times when we attend a state or a national conference, the sessions on accessibility, there might be a handful, but they don't necessarily refer to those with dementia. And so having the opportunity over this week to really be able to spend that time together and to have the conversations around best practices and future plans is something that I'm so excited to do together. And like Sarah, I'm grateful for our donors who have made this time together possible, to Doug and Stephanie, to Dave and Emily here from the Carlisle Adams Foundation. Without your support, we wouldn't be here today. I also want to thank Brittany. You will all enjoy meeting her this week, and truthfully, this week would not have happened without her hard work over this past year. We recently had an African musician working as part of one of our Reflections tours who said, if you want to know something, hang out with older people. They will bless you with their advice. Our first speaker is a man who knows and appreciates the gifts of older people. Damon McLeese has served as executive director of the Access Gallery in Denver for the last 20 years. He works with organizations to address issues of culture and creativity, challenging long-held notions of access, as well as ability and disability. Damon was the 2015 recipient of Denver's Mayor's Award for Innovations in the Arts and the 2017 Governor's Award for Leadership in the Arts in Colorado. We are delighted to hear him speak today. Please help me welcome Damon. Thank you. Thanks. All right. OK, so I had to bring my, my cheat sheet because make sure the slides are in order. Um, first of all, thank you. I am truly honored to be here today. Um, I've never been to North Carolina. So far, I like it. Um, very, very friendly people. Um, the gentleman who drove me over on the bus today from the hotel, I had to get here early. He's like, you're really early. I'm like, yeah, I know. But if I sit in the hotel room any longer, I'm going to get very nervous. And you don't want me to be nervous. So he's like. I could drive you around a little bit. I'm like, <laughs> OK. You know, I'm like, yeah, that's great. And, and he kept talking to me and talking to me and showing me you know, the East Campus and the West Campus. And, and it was really actually quite lovely. I felt very much at home. So thank you again for having me. I, I am still not entirely sure how Jessica got a hold of me, but I, I am so grateful that she did. I'm like, OK, we can definitely do this. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and tell you a little bit about my presentation style, because I am not a lecturer. If I start lecturing, you're going to go to sleep, OK? You're not going to get a lot of numbers. There's not going to be any text on the screen. So just sit back and relax. I do tend to tell stories. And I promise you that the stories all sort of intersect at one point or another. OK, so linear is not a word that's ever used to describe Damon, OK? So we're not going to go from point A to point B, OK? We're going to go to point A to point maybe L or M, and then we're going to come back a little bit, OK? But just to kick this off, I'm going to tell you really how I feel about being here. And let's see if this works. Yes, it works. OK. I am so happy to be here. I, I really am truly blessed to have the job that I've had for 20 years. I've been able to go around the world and all around this country. And I don't have a formal arts education background at all. In fact, when they hired me, one of the questions was, are you an artist? And I could honestly say, no, I am not an artist. OK, I've not taken any formal art training ever. I was sort of thrown into the fire, and it stuck. I truly found a home. I want to talk a little bit about this piece of art, because it sort of encapsulates how I got here today. So about five years ago, maybe six years ago, is um, 
the lady from MoMA still here? Yeah, oh, there you are, hey. So about five years ago, I got a little funding to go to MoMA for the Meet Me at MoMA training, okay? And at that point, the idea of Alzheimer's and memory care and dementia was not even on my horizon professionally. I, it just didn't dawn on me that I would ever be doing anything with people with Alzheimer's or dementia. We were a youth-based program where we were doing school-based programs for kids with disabilities. So the idea of dementia, the idea of Alzheimer's, on a professional level just wasn't on the horizon. But looking back now, it hit me very personally while I was in New York. My mom had just moved into an assisted living center. Um, actually, she was in an independent living center at the moment, but I was getting calls. I'm in New York, okay, and I'm like living it up. I'm at MoMA, I'm like kind of digging it. Um, and I'm getting calls from, from the center saying, you know, your mom has a urinary tract infection, your mom did this, your mom did this. And I'm there for what, three days? And I'm like, okay, wow, what can I do from here? And it was really sort of a harbinger of things to come. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about my mom here in a minute, but while I was at MoMA, I learned something about myself. And what I learned, and what I realized is I learned so much from you all. So I'm here talking about things that I'm passionate about, and that includes all of you. Because museums have been my education. Again, I've never had a formal art class. Well, actually, I take it back in college. I didn't go to Duke, sorry. <laughs> um, I did have an art history class, and I think I got a C. So you know, that's kind of my background. But every time I go to museums, I've always loved museums because I learn. And I remember the one thing that I took away from the Meet Me at MoMA training was just go sit in front of a painting. So like I said, I got here really early, okay? And I just went and sat. There's the, um, oh, what's the artist's name in the main gallery? I just sat there and I got to know one of those paintings. And it was so lovely because how often do we go into a studio or into a gallery and we read about what the artist intended? I never do that anymore. I just go in and sit with the painting. And I was getting a little nervous, you know? My friend from the shuttle bus had left me and I was getting a little <laughs> nervous so I needed to calm myself down. And the artwork just spoke to me. Obviously it was contemporary, obviously it's very colorful, so kind of right up my alley. But getting back to this piece of art, this piece of art is sort of a combination. The first time I ever saw stickers used as art materials was at the MoMA training. And I love that idea of collaborative art. We, we do a lot of collaborative art because the students that I work with are very similar to some of the people that you're going to be working with or that you do work with. But I was at the Denver Art Museum one day, and usually when I'm at the Denver Art Museum or any of the museums in Denver, it's something about an accessibility question. There's a question about a ramp or a bathroom or, or, or something like that. And this particular day, we had just left the meeting and I was leaving. And I ran into a friend of mine and said, hey, we have this artist here. He's gonna do a lecture. He's a Tibetan artist that works with stickers. So he's kind of got this Buddhist thing going on and he's kind of talking about stickers. And I remember the MoMA thing, I'm like, okay, who is this guy? His name's Gonkyar Gyatso. And so I had a choice. Right then and there, I had a choice. I could go back to the office and work on a final report. Okay, <laughs> or I could go learn about Gonkyar Gyatso, all right? So clearly, <laughs> that was a no-brainer for me. You know, the final report eventually got done, I think, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> but I went to this lecture from this Buddhist man from Tibet that I understood about every other word, but his idea was that he was referencing pop art through stickers. And stickers are a wonderfully accessible medium in a lot of different ways. And I had an aha moment. I'm like, okay, we always use the big stickers to talk about collaboration, but what about little tiny stickers, all right? So this, this um, piece of art is actually about this big, and it's made up of 10,000 smiley face stickers made by a group of adults with developmental disabilities, many of them who couldn't hold a paintbrush, and the vast majority of them were nonverbal. Literally took us weeks. And I asked one of our graffiti artists, in a minute you're gonna learn that I work a lot with graffiti artists, I asked him to make us the smiley face, so that's what I got. And it kinda of worked, you know, kinda of worked with the drips and all of that, but that's 10,000 smiley faces, and that's really, really how I feel today. <laughs> so thank you again for having me. At the end, I would love to entertain questions. I do promise you that um, all of my stories do tie back to another, and we will in fact talk about um, Alzheimer's, dementia, and art but thank you again for having me. Um, but before we get to all of that, I really want to talk about something completely different, coloring books. I've had a very long and sordid relationship with coloring books, okay? It started when I was very young. I was in elementary school, okay? So imagine me, six and a half foot tall man, as a little boy, okay? 
When I was very young, I had a very significant speech impediment. I couldn't say S's and I couldn't say R's. And every once in a while, T's would really throw me off too. So every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon, I would go to speech therapy. And I would learn to put my tongue behind my teeth and say S's and R's. Now when I get really tired, I will still have a lisp and my daughter, who's now 23 years old, working at a museum, so maybe someday she'll be here, she loves to tease me about that. Oh, Dad, you have a lisp. And I said, oh, Zoe, you don't have a car. But <laughs> <laughs> so I know how this works. But every Tuesday and Thursday, I would go to speech therapy. But on Tuesday and Thursday afternoons is when the rest of my class got to go to art class. So Tuesday and Thursday, I'm going to learn how to say S's and R's. Oh, and as an added bonus, okay, this is, we moved to Colorado from Texas. My father was from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and my mother was from Memphis, Tennessee. So I had a lot going on, okay? Not only did I have the whole list and the speech impediment, I also had a really, really deep Southern drawl. So I was like cannon fodder for the bullies of the school. So I learned very easily, very quickly, not to talk. That was something that, now Celia knows that I've since got over that, clearly. I know, I, I, I know it sounds a little ironic, a public speaker not really wanting to talk, but I kind of got over that, and here's how I got over that. So on Tuesdays and Thursday afternoons, my class would go to art class, and I would go to speech therapy, and one day the speech therapist was sick. I got to go to art class. I was excited, you know, because speech therapy is pretty structured. And by the end of this, you'll realize just how entirely unstructured I am, but I got to go to art class. And that day I scored. They had new coloring books and crayons for everyone. I threw myself at that coloring book with complete abandon. I mean, I used all 64 colors at once. I mean, I was, I was down with this. I was really proud of myself. I finished first. And I really think that that was the only time in my entire life I finished first in my class at anything. So I ran up to the teacher and I showed her my, my, my drawing of the crayons. I said, look, I used all of these crayons, all of these colors. I thought she was gonna be impressed. I thought she was really going to be happy for me. Good job, Damon. At least get a smiley face on my name, you know? That's not the reaction I got. So a lot of you are already shaking your head because you know what's coming. All right, Damon, you didn't stay within the lines, right? Okay, I didn't stay within the lines. Your desk is a mess. Go clean it up. So I was crestfallen. I really, really was. I was like, dude, really? I didn't get the memo about the lines. I really, I promise. But right then and there, as a child, I decided I wasn't creative. I wasn't creative, I wasn't artistic. Creativity and artistry were for people who could stay within the lines. And I told myself that nearly 40 years. So I went back to speech therapy and I learned how to say S and R, and I learned how to not talk. I spent a lot of time as a child in museums because I found that that was my classroom. I could self-direct myself in a museum. And I had a friend who happened to live close to the museum, so I did really spend a lot of time in museums. But as time went on, and now, of course, looking back as an adult male, I can tell you that she was wrong. The assignment had nothing to do with creativity. It had to do with conformity, okay? And in this country, I do believe we very often, at every age, whether you're in preschool or you're a, a person with Alzheimer's or dementia, I believe that we very often confuse conformity with creativity. And then again, creativity with artistry. So I'm convinced that I'm not creative, okay? I did get into the disability field through camping and recreation programs, and I've worked around people with disabilities literally for 40 years. My first job was a camp counselor for a kid with, in a wheelchair at muscular dystrophy camp. And really, they took me on as a 14-year-old kid because I was big and strong. My entire job was to pick him up and put him down. But, but I made lasting friendships at the, that camp. But I moved throughout my entire life thinking that creativity and artistry were for other people. But I was always drawn like a moth to a flame to anything creative. I married a dancer, all right? I married a woman who has, oh, she's so creative. And I ended up running an art center for people with disabilities, okay? Now think about that for a second. That was their, are you an artist? We've had those before, you know? <laughs> no, no, I'm not an artist. I don't have a creative bone in my body. I find myself running this art center for young people with disabilities, and we're really all about education. I really, really thought, wow, this is great. We take our students to the museums. We get to interrupt things that are going on there. And it's kind of fun, you know? And then a few years ago, we started a program, a summer job program. And a big part of what we do is work with students who are transitioning from high school. 
All right, we work a lot with students like Nicole. So Nicole is 26 years old, I think, 25, 26 years old. All right, she's been with us for about eight years. And I realize that eight years is a long time to be in the job readiness program, okay? She turned 21, she cycled out of the school, and she had nowhere else to go. So she kept coming to the gallery, and we kind of really kind of had to make room for her. Um, she likes to sit at the same place every single day. And the thing about Nicole is, is she has a singular passion. She loves, absolutely loves, to paint dragons. She'll paint dragons and dinosaurs all day, every day. Literally at about the rate of one dinosaur per day. So when we get to the point, I can tell you as a gallery manager, there's not a huge demand for dragon paintings. <laughs> this is not. So at the end of the week, we would sometimes take these paintings out back and we would literally prime over them so she would have a new set for the next week, okay? One day she came up to me, and this is how Nicole, Damon, Damon, look at my dragon. And you look at the dragon. And I'm like, okay, that's a great, dry, really great dragon. It was pink and blue, and I just thought it was, I really thought it was magical. And I was thinking to myself, I need to get more primer. But then, <laughs> because, you know, it's like, okay, we're running out of canvas, we gotta do this. But then I looked at that dragon again, and I said, you know, the castle looked like the Denver Art Museum. Has anyone ever been to Denver? You know, our, one of our museums looks like a castle, and I'm like, a light bulb. I don't have a lot of light bulb moments, but when I have them, they're pretty, pretty profound. I, the next week, we gave her a picture of the Denver Art Museum, and I said, paint the dragon in front of that. And she did, and we sold it. Then she painted one in front of the Denver um, International Airport. We sold that bad, bad boy as well. Then she did a whole series of dragons eating, literally, I think actually this, particular um, painting, those are two dragons eating a restaurant in Denver called Casa Benita. It is like, I mean, they're literally eating the Mexican, it's the worst Mexican food you will ever eat in your life. <laughs> but it, for some reason, it's very popular in Denver, and she's sold like five or six of these. So all of a sudden, this girl who we work with is starting to sell some of her paintings. And one of the things that we've realized along the way is our demographic got older. We went from like middle school and early high school to this transition age to young adults. And now some of our young adults are not so young anymore. But the thing is, is they're all facing a 70% unemployment rate. 70%. Nicole will never have a traditional job. Her job prospects are nil. There is not a huge demand for encyclopedic knowledge of dragons and emotional meltdowns. You just can't put that on, a, no, no matter how you state that on a resume, it doesn't, it just doesn't work. But we found a way for Nicole to make some money. But most of our student, students are a little bit more like Alan. So Alan is the happiest, go luckiest, just gentle soul you will ever meet. This kid comes in, he wants to please, he's eager to work, he will do pretty much whatever you want. And he was in one of our summer job readiness programs. And with a 70% unemployment rate, you would think we really don't have anywhere to go but up, right? 70% unemployment rate, you hire one kid and you're making a difference? Not so much. I mean, this is just staggering to me how hard it is for somebody with a disability to earn money in this country. Last winter, Alan came to us. He was very excited. So this was several months after the, the, job, the summer program. He got a job, all right? So everybody was doing the Alan got a job dance. They were very happy for Alan. I was very happy for Alan, but I was in the back of the studio watching this. You know, Alan was a king for a day. Alan got a job. Everything that we had told him, you work hard, you be on time, you show up, you dress appropriately, all of this will pay off. You just keep hanging in there, hanging in there, hanging in there. And I'm at the back of the gallery saying to myself, wow, my heart's breaking a little bit. Because the job that Alan got was pushing carts at Walmart, all right? This is a kid that is so social and so eager to please, and he got a job pushing carts at Walmart for the holidays, okay? The worst possible job for a kid who really doesn't see all that well to be pushing carts in a frozen parking lot at night. And I realized, you know what, we're kind of, in a way, I was becoming my own Mrs. Nelson. I'm working with these students trying to get them to stay within the lines of society. If they could stay within the lines that society was putting down, they wouldn't have been with me in the first place, right? So right then and there, I got a little pissed off. And when I get, oh, I got a little angry. <laughs> Sorry. 
I got a little angry and I realized, you know what? I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to get these guys ready for jobs that don't exist. I'm going to stop making employees and start making jobs. So we really started shifting. Almost everything that we do from that point forward became about economic opportunity. We started with an Artemat machine. Anybody know what an Artemat machine is? What's an Artemat machine? Artists create small works of art that are dispensed out of old cigarette machines. Exactly. So we got an Artemat machine, and we hired our kids to make artwork for the Artemat machine. I put you on the spot. I'm so sorry. I hope that's OK. But you raise your hand. I'm like, OK. Um, so we got an Artemat machine, and we started paying our kids to make artwork for the Artemat machine. And then we started training them how to paint portraits of people's pets. Then we started going into what is my personal favorite. We started hiring them to make artwork for corporations. I was so determined to get money in their pocket that I started going to corporations. We can make this artwork for your boardroom. We can make it for your lobby. I will make artwork for your bathroom. I really don't care, but give our kids a chance. And we hired professional artists. So the guy in the middle is not a student. Okay? He's one of the best known artists in Denver, and he worked with a team of artists, and we've done 50 commissions for corporations. So this little program has now started to employ some of our students that weren't employable, including Alan. Did I mention that Alan happens to love the Denver Broncos? He, I mean, everyone in Denver loves the Broncos, but Alan really, really loves the Denver Broncos. So he would want to come in and work on the artwork and talk about the Denver Broncos. Denver Broncos, Denver Broncos. Okay, we get it, the Denver Broncos. But so we're making this artwork for corporations. We're starting to see some real success. So about the time that Alan got laid off and Nicole started selling her paintings, we really shifted the culture of our organization. It really became about direct employment for our students. And I do promise you I'm going to get back around to the point of Alzheimer's. It's coming really quickly. But I want to set the tone about how we work. We are a very tiny, tiny little nonprofit organization. I can change, we can change directions on a dime. We can make things happen very, very quickly, whereas larger institutions take a little bit more time to, to change direction. So we're changing directions. I'm really feeling like we found our groove, you know, that, that sort of 18 to 26, well, however old Nicole is now, <laughs> age range is really sort of our sweet spot. We're finding a lot of success. And one of the things, when you run an urban art center, you learn a lot about graffiti, all right? We work a lot with graffiti artists. Some of our teaching artists for these types of programs are um, graffiti artists from the neighborhood. We're in a very, very urban environment. Okay? So we're doing murals. We're getting paid to do murals. So we're doing artemats. We're doing pet portraits. We're doing corporate commissions. We're selling more art for Nicole through the gallery. Everything is moving along swimmingly. Then something happened. Um, this is where it gets a little personal, but bear with me. So I told you I had gone to MoMA just because I could go to MoMA. You know, I really, no offense, but I really didn't have that much interest when I went to the MoMA training. I was just thrilled to go to New York. I'm always interested in learning things, so I don't want to make it sound like, oh, I just wanted to go on a trip, but I wanted to go on a trip, all right? <laughs> but I learned so much from that event. But about the time that all of this really started clicking for the organization, you know, I'm working with an age range that I'm really comfortable with. I'm working with some of the best known artists in Denver. I got a call. And it was um, right about the day of daylight savings times. Don't you hate that day when it changes? Did you know that there's more accidents on that particular day in the spring than any other time of the year? Well, I got a call that day that my mom had fallen and broken her hip. She was, by that time, she was living in pretty independently. She was in an assisted living center, but she was still living pretty independently. And I got to the hospital. And the doctors told me she had a 50-50 chance of making it a year. They had to replace her hip to 90 years old. 50-50 chance of making it a year. And I went from being the son that was seldom seen to her primary caregiver, her decision maker, and her power of attorney overnight. In the course of a month, she went from living in her own apartment to the rehab center, to the hospital, and then eventually to the nursing home. And she hated the nursing home. But in addition to the broken hip and all the other myriad um, health concerns that you have as a 90-year-old woman, she also had Alzheimer's and dementia. And so this is where I was really glad I went to MoMA, because I started remembering some of the things that I had learned, but not really quick enough, as it turns out. You see, when you become the caregiver 
Okay, this is not theoretical for me. This is personal. This is where everything kind of came together for me. When you're the caregiver of somebody with Alzheimer's, you really, truly never know what you're going to get from day to day. I became an extension of her medical team. I was dealing with the doctors, I was dealing with the lawyers, I was dealing with the estate. I still had an apartment to clear out because she wasn't coming back. You don't come back from 90 years old with a broken hip. And it turns out the doctors, they told me she had a 50-50 chance of making it a year. She made it almost six months to the day from the day she fell. When you're that person, and I, I'll, I'll be completely honest, I did not want to be that person. But there was nobody else. So I became all of these things that I suck at. I became an administrator for my mother, and I am not a good administrator. But then I realized that no matter what you do, fighting with the insurance company, getting to the doctor on time, finding the checkbook, you know, finding the socks, that none of that matters because this disease doesn't care. You know, I was trying to be the good son and do the right thing. Take care of mom. That's what you do. You take care of mom. And all I was doing was dealing with all of this bureaucracy and all of this stuff. And I remember this. I, I, this is one of the most vivid memories I have of my entire life. One day, the nursing home called. The nursing home calls. No matter what you're doing, you're going, right? So I'm like, okay. So I go down to the nursing home. I find out whatever crisis it was. I don't even remember what the crisis was, but I remember after I dealt with whatever the crisis was, it usually involved laundry. I don't know why, but this particular time, there was something about the laundry that in that particular facility really didn't work very well. But I went in to see her, and I, I sat down with her, and I always made a point just to hold her hand. Because when you're old and you're frail, and you're in a nursing home, the only people that ever touch you are people that are doing something to you. All right? It's not doing something for you, they're doing something to you. They're helping you do something. So I held her hand, and I looked at her, and I said, Mom, I can't stay today. I have to get back to the gallery. We had a group of students doing a mural on the side of the building, and I wanted to be back there. And I told her, you know what? We have a group of students doing a mural, and I want to be there in case the police show up. Think about that, all right? Because graffiti is still, we had permission. We had the letter. But you know what? I'm, I, I am still dealing with graffiti artists, so I'm not going to let them deal with the police. So I wanted to be there in case the police showed up. And she looked at me, and she said, you know what? I really wish I could come with you. I'm so sick of doing coloring books, I could just spit. And for my mom to say she could just spit, that was a pretty big deal. But I, it dawned on me that the coloring books she was talking about weren't the cool coloring books from Barnes & Noble. Her only creative outlet at that time was children's coloring books. And that really, really pissed me off. And I realized, you know, we spend millions and millions of dollars trying to take care of people at the final days of her life. And this is the best that we could do. And that really, really bothered me. And I got back to the gallery, and it still bothered me. And it bothered me a couple weeks later when she finally did pass. She made it about another two weeks after that conversation. That was one of the last coherent conversations we had. One of the last times I saw her, she didn't recognize me. So the other thing about Alzheimer's and dementia is crisis can accelerate it. And I don't know if that's been anyone else's experience, but she went downhill fast. It wasn't even a hill. It was a cliff. And it was, um, when she did pass, it was, it was a relief. I'll be honest. It was a relief. There was, she didn't want to live anymore. There was nothing left that anybody could say or do. We hadn't had a meaningful conversation. Well, other than the coloring book conversation. <laughs> the coloring book thing just keeps coming back up. But other than that conversation, it had been a long time since we had had a meaningful dialogue. And then one day, I got to thinking about it. And I realized, you know, maybe it wasn't the coloring book. Maybe she really was interested in the graffiti. Maybe she still had a little rebellious streak left in her. You know, maybe she did. I don't know. Um, by this time, we had gotten pretty good at making um, murals. The mural that I was in such a hurry to get back that day has become one of the most photographed murals in Denver. We got paid to do it. We were really sort of moving on it. And I got back, and, and the artist to the right with the sunglasses, his name's Rata Sok. He's one of the best-known muralists in Denver. 
And a couple weeks after that, after my mom had passed, I was still thinking about this. And I asked him, I said, would you be interested in doing graffiti with people with Alzheimer's? He didn't hesitate. Yeah, I would love to do that. When do we start? And if you think about it, people with Alzheimer's and people um, who do graffiti actually have quite a bit in common. Right? They're misunderstood. They have stereotypes put upon them by society, not by their own making. And at the end of the day, they really, really just want to be remembered. Right? They want to leave their mark on this world. So he said, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. When do we start? Full disclosure, this is a kid that had been, in fact, arrested. He had had many, uh, maybe not many, he'd had a few run-ins with the police. And this was how he was making his mark on the world now, as he had left the illegal tagging behind and he was working for us teaching people how to do graffiti. So he was game, he was ready to go. And then I thought about it, really, what is, what is the connection here? Because really, I don't think it was the coloring book. I think, yeah, she would have done anything to get out of the nursing home that day, but I really wonder if it was something left to do with that fear. The fear that she was going to be forgotten, the fear that she was not going to be remembered, the fear that her mark on this world was going to go with her. I believe, I, I, I truly believe this. The people with Alzheimer's know what is happening to them. I don't think there's any question that my mother knew what was happening to her. And it was slow, and it was painful, and it was very, very frustrating. You know, it, it's hard enough on the outside, I can't imagine what it would have looked like from her perspective. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that graffiti artists and people with Alzheimer's really do have an awful lot in common. In fact, one of the very first gra known graffiti artists, this was Taki183. His entire purpose, the only reason that he existed, was to leave his name in all five boroughs of New York City. So the Taki183 was his initials. 183, he lived on 183rd Street. His whole thing was to leave his mark in all five boroughs. So from this, from one of this very early, early graffiti artist, a whole movement, a whole art form has been born. And it's not an art form, you're seeing more and more of it in the museums now, um, but it's not an art form that's very well understood. But at its core, at its most base level, it's really about writing your name on the wall. Okay? I like to joke that sometimes I believe that the, the, the first artwork on the wall was actually not from the shamans in the caves. I really wonder if it was the teenagers, but that could just be me. I don't know. But really, it's about leaving your mark. And this Taki183, um, even after 50 years, people still recognize his tag. They still recognize his mark. So the idea behind graffiti is literally putting your name on the wall. That is the basis of everything that's come after. Now, running an urban art center, I still don't consider myself a graffiti artist. Every once in a while, they'll, let me, they'll, they'll give me a can. And they'll say, okay, fill in this area here, Damon. Now, I don't go outside the lines. And I've gotten, kind of gotten over that whole thing a little bit. But, so they'll let, me, they'll let me spray paint. But I've learned a lot about graffiti. I've learned a lot about the art form. And I truly think that it's one of the most vibrant and exciting art forms that we have today. So we've gone from this about 50 years ago to this. And this is just one example of one artist in Spain. This is a church in Spain that had been abandoned for a long time. And they've turned this into a skate park. So inside, there's skate ramps all over the place. And this graffiti artist, they just gave him free reign. That's a church I might want to go to. Yeah? But isn't that amazing how we went from Taki183, literally leaving his name on the wall just to prove that he existed, to something like that? No, like I said, I've never had any formal art education, but when I do come to a new city, I either go to a museum or I start seeking out some graffiti, some of the walls. I find out where the walls are because I think that this is really amazing work. The thing that amazes me and the thing that encourages me the most is it's collaborative in nature. Right? We think of art and the, art, the, the creation of art as a singular pursuit. But we learn through things like the MoMA training. And I've learned in our studio that sometimes it's better off when you're creating a piece of artwork with a team. There's less pressure to be perfect, right? The one thing that I have learned about creation, creativity, and art is the fact that you don't have to be perfect, right? 
graffiti, you can make a lot of mistakes and you can cover it up, <laughs> which I really personally love. But that idea of doing something together, graffiti artists very often work in what's known as crews. There's a whole group of them. And at the end of the day, they sign their names next to the work. I really liked that idea because one of the things that I felt was so frustrating as a young child is that idea of you can't stay within the lines, therefore you don't belong. Actually, had we had a little bit more open, Miss Nelson been a little bit more open with me, <laughs> we might have had a dialogue, but you know, I was like five, so it probably didn't happen. But um, graffiti continues to grow and to change. I was um, recently in Scotland, and I saw these people who were doing, uh, what, they, what do they call it? Urban crafting. You know, you've seen the yarn bombers. Well, these people have taken this to a whole nother level. So this is an art form that's open and it's constantly evolving. It's constantly changing. Every day I see something new. Every day I'm more and more drawn into it. Um, still want them to let me have more than just my own little section on a mural, but we'll get there, we'll get there eventually. So anyway, I had the graffiti artist. He was on board. He was ready to go. And by this time, I had this germ of an idea. What if we taught people with Alzheimer's and dementia how to do graffiti? I already had made the connections, at least in my own mind. And part of that could have been my own grief process. Maybe there really isn't that much of a connection, but it made sense to me. And being a small nonprofit organization and being pretty much a one-man band, I could do whatever I wanted. So that's the beauty of working for a small group. It's like, oh, I can do this. I just needed some people with Alzheimer's. So I called my friend. I said, Courtney, my friend worked at an assisted living center. I said, Courtney, I want to come out and do some graffiti with some of your clients. And you might imagine that after the initial stunned silence, she's like, okay, you want to do what? She reluctantly agreed. And I was really excited about that. What I didn't expect is to get to the, to the um, assisted living center, and I had to deal with my own emotions because that was a way for me to start processing some of my own grief. But we had four very brave artists that day. And it probably is good that they didn't let me near the, the cans at this point, because I was really kind of a wreck the whole day. I'm like, oh my god. But we had four brave artists that first day. So these are all people with Alzheimer's and dementia. And notice that I call them artists, not patients. Because when you are caregiving for somebody, you really do feel like you're part of that extended medical team. I felt that so much with my mom. It's like, man, I'm just dealing with all of this medical stuff, and I'm not a doctor. But these were our artists that day. All right? They were brave enough to come out and do this with us. And what we started with was their tag. All right? no, we didn't have any Taki 183s. But we had, um, we had Freeman, we had Dolores, and we had Anne. And I realized that Anne couldn't write her name anymore. So Anne made a flower. We showed her how to make a flower. And the fact that she couldn't write her name anymore didn't matter. It simply did not matter. The experience was a communal thing where we were just trying to do this together, just to see if we could. And at this point, this was still a germ of an idea. I really do believe this was partially my own grief coming through in a way for me to process something that I was still trying to understand. But as we were moving along, we were painting. The first thing we did is have everybody leave their mark on the canvas. So this is actually a canvas. Um, they wouldn't let us paint on the wall. <laughs> Don't know why. Um, but we started painting. And after a while, I realized one of the gentlemen had painted a caboose. So we're painting. He had written his name. He could still, actually, I think he wrote his initials. But after a while, everyone's getting comfortable with it. The, the kitchen staff's coming out and watching what's going on. The administrators are coming out. You know, I guess their final reports could wait, too. And everybody was watching what was going on. And, and Freeman, his name is Freeman, he had made a caboose. I went up to him and I said, Freeman, that is an awesome caboose. And I meant it. That was a really good caboose. And he looked at me. With complete clarity. And he said, you know what? I worked on the railroad for 40 years. And some of the people that were there that day that worked with him, the people that fed him, that bathed him, that clothed him, it was clear to me that some of them did not know that about him. All right? Now, I'm not standing up here saying that every time we do graffiti with people with Alzheimer's, we open up some mystical channel, but sometimes we do. He left his mark on me that day. I'm like, wow, we are really onto something here. 
He worked on the railroad for 40 years. That's pretty impressive just in and of itself, but the fact that the people around him didn't know that, and we were somehow able to just see for a brief moment the person who was no longer the patient. So this day was very successful, and as I said, this particular day, I really was just more an observer. I had the camera, but I was kind of a mess. I'll be real honest, I was a hot mess. This was not too terribly long after my mom had passed away, and I'm like, okay, we did this, I thought I'd get it out of my system, but it kind of didn't. Because I kept remembering Freeman. I kept remembering that look in his eye. Yeah, I worked on the railroad. It's like my mom. Because when she told me I'd rather go with you to do graffiti than do another coloring book because I'd rather chew off my arm, that was pretty clear for her. So there's something about that creativity. And it doesn't have to be graffiti. It could be any number of creative outlets for these people. But somehow, some way, we're able to touch into something there. And I personally believe that it has something to do with the fact that we're teaching them something new. That we're not asking them to retrieve a memory. So in the course of 20 years, running an art gallery for people, or running an art program for people with disabilities, I've learned a few things. I've taught people who are blind how to take photographs. I've taught people who are deaf to dance. And we had a program for a while where we had people with spinal cord injuries that didn't have the use of their arms. We taught them how to paint with their teeth. But in all of that experience, I mean, I've done some really crazy things because, again, we can. There's nobody telling me no. So I love to push back against assumptions. I had never thought once about how would we do something with somebody who may not remember. Up until this point, we had done one day with Freeman and his crew. I knew we were on to something, and I thought, what if we do more? But how do you program something? So this is the programmer hat, OK? How do you program something for somebody who may not remember from week to week, or day to day, or sometimes even hour to hour? So that's the other really beauty part about graffiti. It's immediate, right? You don't have to let anything dry, right? In Denver, they have this thing called Art Tank. It's kind of like Shark Tank, but it's for art. <laughs> And I'm like, OK, well, let's see if they would fund us to do some more of this programming. Even though our primary pro focus was still the young people like Alan and Nicole, what would they do? Would they fund us? So we made a pitch, and we got a little extra funding. And the first several sessions that we did were just the same way that we set up the first time when we met Freeman. We'd set up a two-hour block of time. We'd have them come to us. It was easier for them to come to us Oddly enough, because usually they had transportation. Um, the first one we did at the Assisted Living Center was a little bit more challenging. But when they started coming to us, we have an art studio. We are ready to go. We discovered something called water-based spray paint. Okay, I love water-based spray paint. Because you know what? The big mask, the big respirator, that, that regular spray paint, that's nasty. That's like turpent, that, that's just some really nasty chemicals. The water-based stuff has a, a heavier propellant. So the, the, the nasty chemicals, they go down instead of up. So we discovered that. We met some really, really incredible people along the way. But after that first session, the thing that I felt was missing was the caregivers. The people that were there that day were paid to work with Freeman. They were paid to work with Ann. They were paid to be there. And the thing that I really thought was important is to get this idea of including the caregivers. So our first three or four sessions, when we got our first grant sucked. I mean, it was a tiny little grant. I think it was like $2,000. But we made it a point to include and invite the caregivers to come down. Because I knew, firsthand, I knew that they needed a break from the constant care, the constant just what's going to happen next. So we started doing these little two-hour sessions at the studio. And we got all sorts of wonderful, fun people. Um, we had a, a local news station come down. And it was really, really um, pretty an amazing experience to see this little germ of an idea that was really a response on my part to grief become something that is actually um, quite interesting when you really think about it. These people come down with no expectations, none. Sometimes they have a choice, sometimes they don't have a choice. But when they come down, they're pretty open to try anything. And if you really think about it, it's society that's putting across the idea that Older people may not be interested in learning something, or people with Alzheimer's may not be interested in graffiti. Where is that written? It's not written anywhere. 
And what I found is this is a particularly open, they will do pretty much anything because it's so much better than sitting around doing coloring books, I imagine. But we learned that by including the caregivers, we started building some community. We started seeing some things, not only from the caregivers part, but we were all able to just take a break. And when you're in that constant crisis mode, taking a break is so very, very, very important. One day we got a call. Um, this is Lester Holt from NBC News. <coughs> okay. And actually, it wasn't actually him, but it, the guy who called sounded a lot like him, so I pretend that it was. But they wanted to do an <laughs> I can do that, right? <laughs> they wanted to come out from New York and do a story on our Granny Does Graffiti program. All right? I'm like, OK, sure. They're like, we want to come on Thursday. I'm like, OK, but we don't do that on Thursday. We do graffiti on Monday. All right? So I, I got my lines were getting a little bit up. I've got a little bit structured. And I thought that through, and I'm like, you know what? If they want to come on Thursday, we'll make it work on Thursday. And it wasn't like this Thursday. It was, they, they gave us a little bit of warning. So I called up the group that we were working with. I said, can you come on a Thursday instead of Monday? They're like, sure. We can come down. We can make this work. I'm like, Good. I'm really glad you said that, because Lester Holt's coming. <laughs> and we set this thing up. And I really honestly wish I could take credit for this, but this was a happy accident. Remember Alan? So on Thursdays, Alan is in the studio. All right, He's not there on Mondays. So our regular Nicole and Alan and all the students that we normally work with were not seeing the people with Alzheimer's and dementia. They were on two separate days. We have a very limited space. It wasn't anything like I was trying to keep them apart, but as a programmer, you're like, OK, Monday we have two hours. Let's do it then, boom, boom, boom. But on Thursday, when Lester Holt decided to come, he didn't actually come. He sent one of his minions, but it was still cool. Um, Alan was in the studio. Blue and white and orange blur vigorously racing up the walkway is Mary Good, a grandmother of 35 who loves to leave her mark. I really love to, to draw. Usually with a paintbrush or pencil. When we were kids, she would write our names on our lunch sacks. And it was always in a very artistic manner. I am not expecting the Mona Lisa, OK? I'm not expecting a masterpiece. Lately, she's flexing those art muscles through the Johnson Adult Day program, which helps those battling memory loss. Mary has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. My daughters brought me down here because they could see a sadness that I had. Through art, her sadness is erased. But who could have imagined? Oh, look at you, Mary. Her next canvas would be a wall. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Is that enough? Demographically speaking, these seniors do not fit the profile of a graffiti artist. Let's see, that's too big. Yet armed with water-based spray paint, they're defying stereotypes. It's a new idea at the Access Art Gallery in Denver called Granny Does Graffiti. What's it like seeing your mom do this? Oh, it's so fun. The idea came from Damon McLeese, whose mother had dementia. And my belief is that by introducing something new, sometimes it, that opens a different channel or a different pathway in the brain, and we get a glimpse of the person that's still there. For Mary, her initials, MSG, trigger thoughts of her high school, which had the same initials. It's also my school was Mount St. Gertrude. It's just doing so much more for her than just plain old painting, you know? It's bringing back memories. I think this is a lot of fun. Which means Mary can continue to leave her mark. Joe Fryer, NBC News, Denver. So it wasn't Lester Holt. I know I got your hopes up, but this guy was actually really, really cool. He was very, very nice. And, and that story kind of encapsulates what we had learned up to that point. As I mentioned, Alan and I don't think Nicole was in that day, but Alan was in that day. And I love the students that I work with. I really have gotten to know them. I know their families. And I know how challenging life is for most of my students. And so Alan was in that day. And like I said, I've never seen Alan take the initiative for anything. He'll do exactly what you want, and he'd be very happy. And I don't know if you noticed, but every single one of those seniors, OK, this is a little bit of a sidebar, but entertain me for a second. That was the first Bronco game of the year last year. It was on a Thursday night. OK, in Denver in September, you can still get 
90 degree day. So all of these women and men showed up in their Bronco regalia and sweats, sweatshirts and sweatsuits. It was 90 degrees. I'm like, oh my God, Lester Holt, <laughs> we're going to have a whole different story on your hands here if we're not careful. But we, so we started bringing them water. And what wasn't on the camera was the fact that Alan had taken the initiative, because by now Alan had worked on several murals with us as well. He had taken the initiative to start showing people how to use the can. He had assumed leadership because he was so comfortable there. And that's the thing about creativity, and that's the thing that I think I have learned through this entire process. Part of what makes this work is that safe, creative environment. We allow people to try something new in a non-threatening environment. Now, I spend a lot of time in elementary schools. Less so now, but I used to spend a lot of time in elementary schools. And I would go into a first or a second grade class, and I would ask, how many of you feel you're creative? And almost every single hand in a first or second grade classroom goes up. Now I started to do some work in corporations. Every once in a while, they'll let us go in there and do an art project with them. And I asked the same question. How many of you think that you're creative? And usually, less than half the room raises their hand. So that got me to thinking about creativity. So either half the people in the room were in my elementary school class with Miss Nelson, or we've all had similar experiences. And as we get older, some of the lines that we come up against seem to get thicker and blacker, right? It's harder and harder to go outside the lines. And we forget that there's 64 colors in the box. We tend to go back to the same five or six colors, right? And I think that that's what we assume about people who are maybe a little bit older or might have Alzheimer's or dementia. We assume that they're pretty rigid. And what I have found, that they're really not rigid at all. I don't think they have anything left. And I do believe that there is a certain element of that we're doing something a little naughty, OK? If you hang out with old people, every once in a while, you're going to realize they're still pretty rebellious, right? They're still a little bit rebellious. I put that photo in just because it's beautiful. I, really, I just love the look on her face. She came with her daughter, and they had more fun. They were laughing. They were just having a great time the entire time that they were there. But to go back to the Broncos and Alan and the heat that particular day, um, she was making her tag, MSG. So we always start that with the MSG. And that particular day, and this is where I cannot take credit for being brilliant. I can take credit for being lucky. Another piece of my puzzle fell into place. I realized that we could hire these students to work with this population. So we have a multi-generational thing where people are learning about a very dynamic and creative and, I think, exciting art form. And we get to do what I like to do best. We're pushing back against society's assumptions. So it was like the trifecta for me that day. But I still wasn't satisfied. Okay? We're still doing two-hour blocks of time. We come in, we do the same thing. All right, we're going to teach you how to make a tag. We're going to talk about the spray can. We're going to make sure that everyone, everyone understands to point the spray can away from yourself. Okay, that's really an important lesson. We, we usually start with that one. But at the end of the two hours, we're not doing anything really elaborate. So in closing, I'm going to tell you about what we're doing right now. We have, um, after our first funding, and now I can show them the Lester Holt piece. We've actually had a couple local news stories that have gone off very well. But we got another additional group of funding to work specifically with the Alzheimer's Association of Colorado. And we have had the same group. This is truly a group of grannies. There are six women that have been coming to us. I think we have them scheduled for six sessions. And they're in their fourth or fifth session. So we're building. Sometimes we don't even say, do you remember? <laughs> it's not a good way to lead, all right? Do you remember what we did last week? So I got Rata and our students not to do that. But every week, we set up with a different activity. One week, we took a tour of the murals in the, in the alley, because you know, I'm in the really lower downtown area of Denver. There's some fantastic mirrors, murals. And then we worked on our own tag, and we made sure that everyone had a tag that they were happy with. Whether they could remember it the next week or not didn't matter. So they keep coming back to us. And one day, we had a film crew, a local film crew, come in. We're very popular. You know, I think we've had more film crews about Granny doing graffiti than we did in the previous 20 years. So. I have to work on that. But we had a local film crew come in. And we have one of our participants. Her name's Betty. And Betty's a flirt. I mean, Betty likes to flirt. That's just kind of Betty's thing. Oh, how are you? You're so handsome. For a while, she was flirting with me. And, and I'm man enough to say I kind of liked it. I'm OK with that. 
But the guy with the camera, I mean the reporter, oh my god, his tie, I mean, this is model dude. And I am, I'm a lot of things, I am not a model, but she was like, boom, to him. <laughs> I thought, man, they're going home together, I don't want to know. I, but this is just who this woman is. And, and the woman that brings them down, their caregiver, she's, she's like, yeah, Betty's a flirt. She just loves to flirt. That's just part of who she is. Well, last Monday, well, what's today, Wednesday? So two days ago, they came in, and we were working on doing a mural. And if anyone's interested, I'll show you a couple of the pieces that we were doing. This is sort of their pre-graduation before we do a, a bigger mural. And they've decided they want to incorporate dragons into their mural. I don't know where that idea came from. <laughs> But anyway, Betty came in, and as soon as she walked in the door, I knew something was wrong. There was that look, that look. She was afraid. There was something that was making her uncomfortable. And I recognized that look from my mother. I recognize that look now from time and time and time again. But Betty walked in, and there was something that was not, I mean, she was just really not having a good day. I'm like, oh, okay, this is going to be interesting, because up until this point, we've been fairly fortunate. I mean, we see these people for a couple hour blocks of time. You really don't get to know them like I know Alan, and, but I knew. And I just looked at her. You're okay. We got her situated. And this is the beauty about what we do, is it's a team effort. They're all in this together, and nobody has to do anything that they don't want to do, but we sat them down outside on the wall that we were working on and we were explaining what we were going to do and, and we demonstrate a lot. And I kept watching her. And you know, anyone that know, how many of you know that look? You know what I'm talking about, right? It's a little freaky, isn't it? It's like, okay. Because you know there's something going on that's making her that incredibly uncomfortable. But after we'd been at it for a while, I noticed something. I noticed she had relaxed. She wasn't breathing as much, I mean, as quickly. She wasn't looking around like, oh my god, the sky's falling. She just sort of fell into that, that routine. She sort of got a little bit more comfortable. And at the end of the day, we finished up what we were doing, and they were all leaving. I said, okay, bye, Betty. And she turned around and she winked at me. <laughs> and I was like, okay. At the beginning of the talk, I told you I am not a lecturer per se. I'm a storyteller. I'm also not a researcher. I can't give you the numbers of why this is working, but I've seen it firsthand. What we're doing, what you're doing, there's something here. All right? The one thing that I do regret, I regret that I left that day to go back to the gallery. I wish I would have sat down and just colored with my mother. I didn't have that, but from there, some really amazing and interesting things have happened. And I told you early on that I convinced myself that I wasn't creative and artistic, right? So I know that sounds really odd while you run an art center, but I was convinced for the longest time I wasn't creative or artistic in any way. And the best I could do was draw from the things that you all in museums would put up on the wall, because that was my art education. But as my mom was in the final months of her life, I started drawing. I started creating because I needed something I could control. So now I'm not ready to say I'm an artist, but I am really ready to say I'm a creative. And the best part of my job is I get to share that excitement about creativity with everyone from preschoolers to people that are in their 90s. Actually, we had one guy that was 100. So I want to encourage you, if you will, just remember, it's really never too late. Thank you. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions? Come on. All right, there we go. So they came once a week? Mm hmm Oh, okay. That's a lot, yeah. Yeah, but we had them for six sessions, the, the group that we're currently with, so they have one more session. Yeah. Yes? So did you find that you, you could work with people who had some issues with mobility? Absolutely. And, and coordination, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And that is something, that's actually a, an excellent question. A lot of the people that we work with, they might have arthritis or they might have something to do. We figured out a couple different ways. First of all, the two finger approach really, really works. The idea of getting really close really, really works. And then we've also got the point where somebody else can hold the, the can and we can put a board on it so you have a little bit more leverage. So we have addressed some of those. I mean, that's something that I'm really comfortable with. I mean, we paint with wheelchairs, so we, we can figure out some of that type of thing pretty easily. There's also, um, a trigger that you can 
by where it's more of a grip to put onto the spray can. Yes? Either one. <laughs> are you working with the same um, uh, retirement community throughout this, or? or well, up until this group that we've had now, we, it's been a mixture. The group that we're working with now that has um, the six grandmothers, they're, they're coming from one place, and they've already approached us about going to them and painting a wall in their actual facility. But up until this, this group, it had always been just a one-off. It had been a two-hour thing. Mm -hmm. That's the second part, but I just, oh, uh, hell no. Yeah, of course you <laughs> Are there any sort of funding sources like Medicare? You know, can Medicare pay for some aspect of this somehow? Or? Um, we haven't gotten that far. Um, we've been relying on um, community foundations and some, some other kinds of support. I imagine that somebody who had a larger staff and a little bit more administrative minded would probably be able to figure that out. But right now, this is really just a program that's sort of in its infancy for us. But funding's always an issue, but we'll, we'll, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so way back in the beginning of your talk, mm -hmm. you were first talking about your coloring book experience yes. in school. Um, you, you mentioned that conformity and creativity were uh -huh. confused, mm -hmm. and then your next sentence was about creativity and artistry. Yes. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that, please. Yes, I personally believe that those two things are very often, um, creativity and artistry are different things. And I think that what we confuse, what I confused as a young child was my coloring book piece wasn't artistic. It didn't have the aesthetic that somebody was looking for. I believe, personally, I believe I am creative off the charts. I really suck at being an administrator. I have been white knuckling it for so long just to be around all of this creativity. So my belief is that creativity is sort of that essence, that drive to create something, and it doesn't have to be pretty. I've been making artwork now for two years that nobody other than my wife has ever seen. But that drive just to control the environment. Artistry, to me, implies mastery. You're working towards something, a skill building, yeah. The very simple act of creativity, I believe, is just let's experience this. And we can learn so much by just being open to the idea of creativity. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens when we give him a spray can. He took over. He was like, okay, I'm in charge here. And he was making color selections and all of that. But to me, that's the difference between your conformity and creativity. We all understand through the coloring book. But to me, when you're starting to get into artistry, you're talking about skill mastery and those types of things. Okay. From a financial guy. So is there okay. a cost per person and is it scalable? I mean, obviously. I'm Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I don't know how. I mean, I'll be honest. <laughs> And, and this is one thing that I think it really is important to realize. I have one employee. So my job, quite honestly, is to hustle. I don't know if it's scalable. I imagine it's scalable. Um, if we ever wanted it to get bigger, we would have to obviously get more, more funding. It's just somebody gave us some funding. This is what we said we were going to do. And this is what we're doing. But it keeps growing and getting built, built bigger. Do you just work with one facility right now? At the moment, but we've worked with five or six different groups. And then now, so to get back to the financial question, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, we could probably figure out, and what we would do is figure out how much we're paying the artists and, and the materials and that kind of stuff. But we could definitely figure that out. Um, I just haven't had a need to just yet. No, so, sorry. <laughs> yeah. There was a disclaimer at the beginning. No. <laughs> yeah, so, and you had a. For specifically the graffiti or just in general? Sure, in general, the, the graffiti. Well, see, um, we're located in an art district. So I run a gallery. On any given first Friday of the month, we'll have 1,000 to 1,500 people walk through our front door. So we're, we're pretty, pretty well set. Having done this as long as I've done, I know all of the well-known artists around town. They give us money for fundraising events and that kind of stuff. So I get a feel for who's sort of a good teacher as opposed to who's more of a, just, just a pure on artist. So the ones that I feel like the guy that I showed you that I pointed out is not, he is brilliant. He is the best natural teacher I've ever seen. So I don't know if I mentioned this, but the corporate artwork that was standing behind them, we didn't use a paintbrush on that thing at all. He was able to talk about shape and color, and that was for an architectural firm. But then there's some artists, quite honestly, Rata, the, the graffiti artist, he's not a great natural teacher. 
we're working with him on that. So a lot of times I'll just take the lead on the sort of the teaching part. But you also get a feel for it after a while. And then we have another artist who I, I adore him, but yeah, we don't ever leave him alone. With <laughs> Not, not for anything like weird. It's just yeah, you know, he's not a he's not a good teacher. So, so it's kind of a gut feeling. Yes. I'm I'm curious about the caregivers' role mm -hmm. when you're working together. We just give them the can. They're participants. They're equal. They're doing it at the same time. And that's I didn't talk a lot about my belief about collaborative art, but there's a certain pressure. You know, this is what I truly believe. This if I ask you all to draw something on your paper right now, some of you are going to get anxious. Right? But if I ask you to sit down and draw with somebody, some of that pressure goes down. So when the caregivers are there, they're equal participants. And the lady who was talking about her mom that was going like 90 miles an hour, she had so much fun. At first she was reluctant, no, this is for her, this is for her. And I kept encouraging her, no, this is for both of you. And by the end, she was in there doing it together. And it was a shared experience that I can guarantee you, mom may not remember. I don't have any earthly idea if she does, but I can guarantee you the daughter remembers it. Yes. Um, just related to her question about caregivers, um, mm -hmm. what, were people uh, responsive and energetic when approached about um, you know, participating in a project? And if so, was that a one-off thing where you would have somebody come in one time, or did it? We started that as a one-off. We did the first few sessions we did like with Freeman and the train. We went to them. We didn't have anyone other than paid caregivers there that day. Then I realized that that was part of the equation that we needed to follow up on. So the next time we had the groups start coming to us and we made sure that the groups knew that they could, anyone could come along, anyone was welcome. And the group that we're working with now, their caregivers aren't coming along with them because it's a set day program, but they'd be more than welcome. Sometimes a daughter or actually um, one of the ladies had her sister in the other day and, you know, oh no, it's not for me. I'm like, yeah, it is. If you're here, <laughs> so I can do that. <laughs> no, if you're here, you're going to help us paint. So, last I'm one. I'm just going to thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.